All right, thanks so much, Joey. Well, time now for a check of your top stories. And we start today in Puerto Rico, where painters preserved the African Taino history through art. And that's the story of a painter that lives in one of the most iconic black heritage towns. Our Francis Felix, Felix joins us with this first story. African Taino heritage is immersed in old art expressions in our island. Paintings emphasize music, women, spiritual gods, and food that involves traditions and past history. Very powerful expression in this black root. I paint more than that. I paint because all the experience what I have in my town, when I live, when I go into a bomba dance in the barrio, when I see the festival of Loisa, when the people, the still life of people of my town, that to me, my element of art. I am very proud to express people in my, in my people landscape, no, no, all this cultural expression in my work. I try to show that energy to another person receive how proud we are of our black. Uh, ancestor, no? The workshop of Samuel Lin is located in the town of Loisa that keeps the most of our African Taino history with the natural cultural manifestations. Lin tells us that he's an artist of his environment and he likes to portray the landscape and the expressions of common people of his town Loisa. Also the figure of the black woman is a highlight in his work where sculptures and paintings sense the message of the importance and power of women in their families and communities. I think the most important message in my work is, is show the Puerto Rican no, roots, very important, no? in everything, in, in the landscape, in the still life of people, in the, in the cultural expression our identity in, in my art, because I come from a town, in Loisa is a town, descendant slave. It's the most black town in Puerto Rico. And I'm born to see all these things, all this. And to me, my most important element in my art is express this proud, no? Puerto Rican painters have the responsibility of preserve through all forms of art the legacy of the African Taino history. From Loisa, Puerto Rico, Frances Felix. All right, thanks so much, Frances. In the meantime, a woman is making history in Jamaica as the first female leader of Jamaica's Defense Force. Our One Caribbean News, Deandra Hamilton, brings us her story. Jamaica welcomed its first female Chief of Defense Staff, CDS, of the Jamaica Defense Force, JDF, Rear Admiral Antoinette Sandra Lee Weems Gorman last Thursday. It is the first time for a woman to hold this post in the 60 years of the JDF. The newly appointed CDS joined the Jamaica Defense Force as a Coast Guard officer in August 92. Her career includes appointments on shore such as Unit Operations Officer and Second in Command of the JDF Air Wing. In speaking of the swearing-in ceremony on January 20th, Rear Admiral Weems Gorman expressed gratitude for the display of confidence in her ability. I am humbled and privileged to be confirmed as the next Chief of Defense Staff for the Jamaica Defense Force. I wish to thank the Governor General and the Defense Board for having confidence in my ability to command the men and women of the force. I commit to upholding the oath of office that I have just taken today. In doing so, I commit to decisive firm and strategic leadership, which is required in today's complex and ever-changing security environment. Only the second woman in history worldwide to head a military body, and the only woman heading one now, where Admiral Weems Gorman reflected on those who paved the way. I must recognize and thank all the former chiefs who have all played significant roles in my development. A salute to Jamaica and the Rear Admiral on her appointment. Do well. De and that was our DeAndre Hamilton reporting there. In the meantime, Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley on Monday announced a new cabinet and signaled her intention to ask Parliament 
to bring a constitutional amendment to allow an 18-year-old to serve for the first time on the premise that, quote, if you are old enough to vote, you must be old enough to serve, end quote. Prime Minister Motley said she would like to appoint 18-year-old former Queens College student Kahil Kathawala as the island's youngest senator. However, by virtue of his age, Kathawala is currently unable to do so, prompting the need for a constitutional amendment. Motley addressed the nation four days after successfully securing a second consecutive 30-0 victory at the polls. Now, she said her government had an ambitious transformative agenda and for the first time named a deputy prime minister in the person of Santa Bradshaw. In addition, she also indicated government's intention to reach out to the opposition parties to appoint senators in the upper house. During the election campaign, I made a promise, a serious promise to engage our young people and to bring them into the center of governance and national self-determination. It is in my view an anomaly that a person who is 18 years old in Barbados has the right to vote, but they do not have the capacity to serve in the Senate of our nation. It is therefore my intention to correct this by asking the cabinet to agree and parliament thereafter to bring a constitutional amendment to allow an 18 year old to serve in the Senate of Barbados for the first time. I propose, should it be accepted and successful, that Senator Khalil Kothiwalda should be that person who will serve as a senator. I have said from the very beginning, if you're old enough to vote, then you must be old enough to serve. I look forward to the support of all across civil society for this fundamental change. And meantime, average daily COVID-19 cases are trending down, but hospitalizations continue to rise. And while the current variant appears to not be as deadly as Delta, especially among those vaccinated and boosted, U.S. health experts warn don't underestimate Omicron. Mandy Gaither reports. Across the U.S., it spread like wildfire. But the stunning thing about Omicron is how remarkably infectious it is. I've been doing infectious disease control for 30 years, and with the possible exception of measles, it is the most infectious virus I've seen. In less than two months, Omicron has packed a punch on the U.S., setting records after accounting for nearly all new COVID cases, pushing Delta into the background. While cases may fall as quickly as they rose, health experts say don't count the variant out just yet. The biggest risk is that the fact that we are all so very tired of COVID will lead to us letting down our guard. And if another variant comes, we won't respond effectively. Former CDC Director Dr. Tom Frieden says for people who are vaccinated and boosted, which is now about a quarter of the U.S. population, COVID-19 caused by Omicron may be similar in severity to the flu in many respects, or they may have no symptoms at all. The concern comes with those who aren't vaccinated. The virus is adapting. As long as we adapt, we can move forward. If we don't adapt to the virus, it's going to continue to get ahead of us because no one, and I want to emphasize this, no one can predict with accuracy what's coming after Omicron.